My name is Steve Evans, and I'm from the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. And I'll be talking about um, where are we here? I'll be talking about uh, the actual details of the 2011 uh, major earthquake, huge earthquake, and also a massive tsunami. And by the way, I should acknowledge right at the, uh, right at the beginning, uh, Keith Delaney, my graduate student, who put some of these images together. And of course, this image here is probably one of the defining images that we'll uh, that we'll ever see about a natural disaster. And it occurred in a place called Kisinuma, which I'll be talking about later on. And just to zoom in here, uh, from Alan's geographical, geological perspective, here are some major Japanese cities, of course, Nagasaki down here, Kobe here, Tokyo here. And uh, the area that's affected by this tsunami is actually in yellow right on the eastern coast of Honshu. It's a length of about 700 kilometers. And you can see the Japan Trench that I'll mention here, and we can see the epicenter of the March, March 11th earthquake right here. The focal depth is roughly speaking 24 to 30 kilometers about that. The area which ruptured, the area which ruptured is approximately 80,000 square kilometers. It's a huge area of the crust that actually ruptured in a very, very short time. Of course, I'll be talking about that in a moment. And, uh, and uh, uh, to relate that to the development of the tsunami. Okay, let's zoom in a bit further. Here's Tokyo again. Here's the famous power station that we'll hear more about later on. Uh, the town of Sendai here, which is like run zero for damage, if you like, in the tsunami. The epicenter over here, and some towns, uh, Mina, Mini Sanriku, north to Kesanuma, in this indented coastline north of Sendai. And it's very, very important to distinguish the geomorphology of the northern coast here to the southern coast here, or from the southern coast there. And once again, the length of coastline that was affected by the tsunami is roughly speaking about 700 kilometers. Huge, huge length of damage. And now I mentioned the subduction, the subduction of the Pacific plate below the North American plate, which is a sliver of the North American plate as it comes south actually between the Eurasian plate and the Pacific plate. And this is actually a geological cross-section or geophysical cross-section that was done in 19, uh, sorry, 2004 by Takahashi. And it is roughly speaking right through the middle of this area here, just off the coast of uh, Kesinuma, right more or less where the epicenter of the March 11 earthquake is found. And we can see that the subducting, the subducting plate is like this, the Pacific plate, and we can see the overlying North American plate. And we can see the epicenter is dead on the boundary between those two plates. And of course it was the movement of the North American plate into the Pacific which actually generated the tsunami in the way that Alan just mentioned. So it really is geology fantastico. <laughs> and these are the epicenters of earthquakes which, uh, which occurred greater than magnitude uh, 4.0 from March the 9th to March the 27th. There are 581 uh, 581 epicenters on this map, and if you ha um, and if you have the iPhone app called uh, called Earthquakes, which is actually connected to the USGS website, you would have gotten lots of pings over the last couple of weeks, and certainly I did get lots of pings. Some during my lecture, <laughs> to which I again apologize to my students for pinging all the time when I was giving my lecture. Anyway, so we can see the major uh, the main the main shock is right here. And this huge area of aftershocks indicates the huge area that was ruptured on March the 11th. Just to start in the southern part of the zone and show you some photographs of the tsunami, which are some of the most incredible images ever recorded of a natural disaster. Starting in the south, this is Onohama Port in Fukushima Prefecture. And then we have the nuclear power station at, at uh, Fukushima number one. Here is the satellite image shortly afterwards showing the damaged reactors. And in fact, when we, when we look around, um, um, it was obvious that the Japanese engineers had considered this eventuality in the design of their power station. I mean, they weren't, they weren't sort of, well, I'm not going to say idiots, but they did take this into consideration when they designed their power stations. And they did very, very complex studies about risk, and they did very, very complex studies about the behavior of tsunamis. And they even looked at the scenarios, uh, which we'll hear about later on, they even looked at the scenarios which led eventually to the damage to the Fukushima number one. 
and we can actually see the plume going out. This is actually a satellite image taken on March the 19th. We can see the plume of radioactive water actually going out into the Pacific from the stricken power station right there. And some of the photographs which I'll show you now are, as I mentioned, some of the most spectacular I've ever seen of a natural event or a natural disaster event. And this is the tidal wave or the tsunami coming in at Sendai Airport, which is in the southern part or in the central part of the damaged area. This is the enlargement of that showing the turbulent water moving in at about 15 meters per second, which is faster than Usain Bolt can run. Uh, so you can just imagine the overwhelming force of this. In the airport, we saw these pictures of the airport, of the terminal, and the runway under tsunami water. And it's interesting. I was wondering, how did these guys know that there was a tsunami coming? Because I was, you know, think to myself, uh, uh, that tsunami waves in the ocean travel at you know, hundreds of meters per second and they maybe had five minutes warning. Well, that wasn't the case. The earthquake took place, I forgot the exact time. Anybody? 224. 224. 224, was it? Okay. So you've got plenty of, uh, Right. Plenty so, um, the wave here struck the airport and there's a video, there's a video with the time actually on the video. The wave actually struck the airport at 1550, which is 64 minutes after the earthquake. In other words, the earthquake took place, the shaking took place, and they realized that this would lead to a tsunami, so they, they certainly did evacuate people, and at that time the news helicopters took off, I suppose, hoping that, that, that they would get some shots. And in the Sendai case, which is in the central part of the damage zone, they had 64 minutes warning. But the damage in Sendai alone is, is very, very graphic and very, very devastating. And this is Natori City, near Sendai, where people actually took pictures of the oncoming wave, the tsunami, I should say. You can see it uh, you know, coming through the trees here, and I'm sure this photograph will be in textbooks for the next half, you know, half, a, half a century. Um, and the aftermath of the wave of the tsunami, as well as a, as a second or third or fourth wave coming in after the major wave came in. So these photographs are amazing in the flat sort of in the flat plain of the coastal area around Sendai. And as we move further north, we have an indented coastline, and this is where the horrible damage is 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 actually focused. And this is the town of Anagawa, and we can see here the the cars on top of the buildings, signifying the height of the wave. This is Minami. San Riku, which is formerly Shizugawa, and I'll be coming to that right at the end of my talk. Shizugawa, remember that name. This is before, uh, sorry, this is after the tsunami. Notice the soccer pitch here. Uh, notice these buildings. And this is the view from Google Earth from more or less the same angle. And we can see here the railway embankment, here the, uh, the Channel River, here, and there's the Google Earth image with the railway embankment and the channel, the, the, uh, the, uh, the channel River. So, this is the sort of damage, and some of the damage at Kensunu, uh, Kensenuma City was spectacular in the sense of all these boats were tossed around and smashed into the wrecked buildings. When I was mentioning the indented coastline, this is what it looks like on a satellite image, and this is the town of Riz, Rizu, Riku Zenta, uh, whatever. <laughs> I, I'm really sorry about my Japanese. And we can see the extensive damage and, uh, and uh, mayhem that was caused at this location. And this is Risen Takata, there we are, and this is what it is today. Just absolutely amazing damage. And here we see uh, the city of Ofunato. And Ofunato is famous because it was thought to be totally protected by this gigantic tsunami wall uh, which extended uh, like a fair ways down the inlet from the village. And the people of Ofunato assumed they were safe from a tsunami. But the maximum recorded height was uh, something like 15 or 20 meters, and it was 29 minutes after the earthquake. So people did have an opportunity to escape to higher ground. So this is a 6,000-ton ship, which was being tossed up on the way and thrust into the community of Kimeshi, which I'll talk about also later on. This is the community of Otsushi. This is the famous Miyako, one minute. And Miyako, you may have seen the video. I should mention, I'm just about finished. I should mention the tsunami warning system that existed, or that exists in the Pacific. 
And, I, and these are all dark buoys, or buoys. These are uh, sensing devices on the ocean floor. And we can see 21418 there recorded the tsunami wave right here and sent out the warning across the network in the Pacific. Now, very importantly, the first thing that a natural disaster specialist does when there's a disaster is look for evidence of previous disasters. Lo and behold, in, in 1896, June 1896, at Shizugawa, remember I mentioned that? This is damage from a great tsunami which occurred on this coastline. Shizugawa is here, Kimeshi is here. These are the same, the same, the same communities that have been completely erased uh, this year on March the 11th. And in 1896, they suffered massive death tolls something in the order of 28,000 deaths. In 1933, the same coastline was struck by a tsunami which was generated by an 8.4 earthquake, 4,500 deaths. It is really quite a telling comparison. And not only that, the analyses of the 1933 Great Sanriku tsunami was done in quite a bit of detail. Wave height, the destruction of number of houses versus wave height, and anything <coughs> over eight meters, 100% of the houses are destroyed. So, finally, what are, what are the big lessons? Okay, uh, some of the largest earthquakes uh, recorded since seismology uh, became of age, around about 1900. The uh, 2011 Japan earthquake, 9.0, is the fourth largest. And they all occur on subduction zones. These are some of the issues which I'm sure that we'll discuss in the round table at the end of the, the, end of the meeting. Warning issues, the siting of strategic infrastructure, uh, the, emergency, uh, the emergency preparedness, the, the disaster preparedness, the magnitude of the death toll, and anybody that knows anything about Japan will know the Japanese will be very, very sensitive to the precise number of people who perish. And what about pre-event uh, uh, risk assessment and mitigation with respect to siting of key strategic infrastructure? These are some of the questions that we'll ask. Thank you.